Hello everyone. Today we will do a problem solving and I chose a problem from Russian National Olympiad. It has a medium difficulty. So let's get started. All right, here is our problem. So let's read it first. It says hydrocarbon 1 is extracted from low boiling fractions of petroleum pyrolysis using rectification. Hydrocarbon 1 slowly dimerized to form a single product 2, which can be converted back to 1 at high temperatures. And the homologue of 1, compound 3, was first prepared by Wilcock in 1960s through a multi-step synthesis starting from 2-methyl cyclohexanol. And here is the synthesis. And they ask us to draw the structure formulas of all ciphered compounds. First thing first, here you see a lot of uh, sentences, bunch of words. What we are going to do first is to write them in diagram form so that when we need to look up for information, it's easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert these sentences into a simple diagram. So this is what we are given. We have petroleum from pyrolysis. We get hydrocarbon 1 and 2. Uh, 2 is the dimer of 1. They are interconverting to each other. And homologue of hydrocarbon 1. Homologue means there is a 1 or multiple CH2 difference between two compounds. So homologue of hydrocarbon 1 is compound 3. And this is what we are going to synthesize. So I'm not saying that all of this information are going to be useful to us. It's just that I converted this text into diagram form. So you have to take a note of this kind of things when you solve the problem so that you can easily refer to whenever you need to. So now going back to the question. So let's focus on the synthesis. And as I can see from this part of the text, there's nothing useful that could help me in order to find out the structure of any of these compounds. This is just talking about hydrocarbon 1, which is not even in the synthesis. And 3, is it says it's the homologue of 1. It's just here, but there is no specific piece of information that I can use in my synthesis. Also, there is no any information here. It just says draw the structure formulas. There is no any spectral information. There is no any molecular formula. There are some molecular formula, but they are within the synthesis. So we are going to focus on the synthesis itself without any extra information. So the first, what we are going to do is we are going to try to find out what these reagents do just to have a rough idea of what is going on. So I'm going to label each step, each reagent or set of reagents with their purpose. For example, this system, dichromate in the presence of sulfuric acid, that is commonly used for oxidation of alcohols. Here we have methylation reaction. We have a base. It's going to depotonate an acidic proton and it will install a methyl group. This step uses a very strong oxidizing agent, a nitric acid. So I am expecting some oxidation here and this compound C, I'm expecting it to have a lot of oxygens connected to carbon. And then I know for sure that this is used in reduction. So I'm expecting some aldehyde or ketone to be reduced to alcohol here. And this is n bromosubkinimid This is used mainly used as brominating agent. And lastly, pyridine, which usually functions as base. So these things I put here, these labels that I have attached to these reagents, we are not 100% sure about their label purpose, but it is just for us to give a rough idea of what is going on. So I know that maybe I have to expect an alcohol for G. I have to expect some ketone or aldehyde for compound F. I am expecting some ox strong oxidation reaction here. You have uh, these kind of rough ideas. It's very useful for us to pre-label so that we can start our synthesis with as much as information possible. So let's focus on the first part because as you can see, there is a, a, some information given for us for compound D and then there is no any other structure given. So that probably means we should be able to find out the structure of D using the combination of previous information, the set of reagents leading to it, plus its molecular formula. So I'm going to focus on this part of the synthesis first. And first step, as I mentioned, this is used in oxidation of alcohols, and I have alcohol, secondary alcohol, so I'm going to oxidize it and it will form a ketone. So this is very easy, right? And now we are going to talk about the deprotonation of this ketone A because we are using a base here, sodium a amide. So let's take our ketone A and as you see, this is unsymmetrical ketone. So it has two sides, more hindered side here, the base is going to approach and take a proton from here. And the resulting enolate is going to be obviously more stable because it's more substitute, as you can see. So it's a tetra substitute compound, if you remember, from alkene stability. 
it's like a tetra substitute, so it's obviously more stable in compared to this enolate, which is only tri substitute. So this is tetra substitute and this is tri substitute. So obviously I expect this enolate to be more stable. And since this is more stable, I am calling it a thermodynamic enolate. And in order to make this, I need to use less hindered phase like sodium amide, so sodium hydride. On the other hand, for this one, which I call as a kinetic enolate, I need to use kinetic conditions like lower temperature, more hindered phase like LDA or tetrabotoxide. They can come from less hindered site, take the proton and make a kinetic enolate quickly. Yes, it's not stable, but it's going to form very quickly. So since in this specific synthesis step, we are using less hindered phase, sodium amide, our product will be thermodynamic enolate. Once we have this, it's going to attack to our electrophile, which is methyl iodide. And it's just a simple SN2 reaction. So we are going to install a metal group here. And, uh, and our next step would be complete. And now we get our A and B. So as you can see here, this is our compound B. Now let's try to find out the structure of C and D. So let's do some counting here. This compound has 7 carbon atoms. And this compound D, as you can see from molecule formula, has 12 carbon atoms. So what happened here is that you have added 5 carbon atoms. We already added 1 here by installing a metal group here. So we, from B to D, we need to add 4 carbons, right? Because total, there's a 5 carbon increase. And we know that this is a strong oxidizing agent. So it's not supposed to bring any carbon atom. So that leaves us with this information that from C to D, we have to have four carbon atoms. So it's like two equivalent of ethanol we are going to use. So because I see from C to D only two carbons, but from B to D, I need to add four carbons. So that means I need to have two equivalents of ethanol. So that's just, again, what we can get from this limited information about the reagents and, and also number of carbon atoms. But now let's calculate HDI. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you what HDI is, how to calculate it, and how is it helpful for us in helping out determining the structures. So here is the molecular formula of compound D. We are given this. And here, this is like 2N plus 2, where N shows the number of carbon atoms. This helps us to find the maximum number of hydrogens. So in this specific compound that have 12 carbon atoms, maximum we can have 26, not more than that. But we have only 22. So the difference between the maximum number of hydrogens and the number of hydrogens that exist in the compound divided by two gives us hydrogen deficiency index, or you can call it as elements of concentration as well. And oxygen, sulfur, we don't usually count them in HDI calculation. And uh, halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, we, we treat them as hydrogens when we try to find out HDI. We will have a lot of examples where we will need to calculate HDI because it actually gives some structural information. For example, in this specific case, HDI being equal to 2 implies one of these four cases. It can have two rings because one ring contributes to one HDI. It could be two double bonds or a combination of a ring and one double bond, or it could be a triple bond. So one HDI means either a pi bond or a, a ring. And here are all possibilities, basically. So now we are going to combine this HDI information with the information of the reagents of the next steps. And we are going to combine them and in order to find out, hopefully, something useful about the structures. Uh, this reaction here, so we already know that this compound D has HDI2. And this reaction of converting from C to D, this is actually a Fischer esterification. And we already know that this should be two equivalent. We find out that from counting the carbons, this should be two equivalent. So what does that mean is that compound C should be decarboxylic acid. So it should have two COOA groups somewhere like this so that I can install two of these uh, ethanol in the presence of acid catalyst. So future esterification looks like this RCOOH and we take another alcohol in an acidic environment and then they just combine to give an ester. Since I'm using two equivalent of this, I need to have decarboxylic acid so that I can install ethanol on both sides. Now, let's combine all of this information together. Now, I know that from B to C, it's going to be strong oxidation reaction. C should be decarboxylic acid. And then we are going to have Fischer esterification to yield a compound D, which has HDI of 2. And this HDI of 2 probably means two double bonds because we need 
decarboxylic acid, right? And from C to D, we don't have any change in HDI. And since this should be decarboxylic acid, and this is very strong oxidizing agent, I am thinking about cleaving carbon-carbon bonds. So there are two possibilities. These carbon-carbon bonds between carbon number one and carbon number six, and also carbon number six and carbon number five, these are the most susceptible to cleavage by a strong oxidizing agent like nitric acid. So I have two possibilities. One is I can break the bond between carbon one and six, and I will get this compound. And what I do is I break the bonds between carbon carbon, and I just attach OH uh, to this side. O OH, or depending on availability of hydrogens, I can go all the way to COOH. For example, when I break this bond, I have carbon 1, this is carbon 1, this is 8, this is 9, and this is 2, and the rest of the ring. So I have only one, one hydrogen, let's say, one hydrogen, I'm just writing it in parentheses. So there's only one possibility of oxidation, so I can make it OH. So that's why I get this part here, and when I break it for carbon number 6, I already have one CO, so what I can do is I can add OH group here. So this is how oxidation works. And this compound you see here would be a result of the cleavage of the bond between 1 and 6. And this, the same idea apply, you just put OH groups. If I break the blue band, then uh, carbon number 5 here, as you can see, it has actually a potential of 3 hydrogens. So I can oxidize, oxidize it all the way to... COO. So intermediate step would be like, and then aldehyde, and then carboxylic acid. So you can think of it as a step-by-step -step oxidation, all the way from alkane to alcohol to aldehyde, and then carboxylic acid, because nitric acid is a very strong oxidizing agent. It will not leave it as alcohol. And between these two possibilities, honestly, both of them uh, are possible. But since we need the carboxylic acid, this one I will choose as the structure of compound C. So actually, without needing to uh, look for the rest of the synthesis, we are able to find out the structure of C, which is the decarboxylic acid, and structure of compound D, which is the, to, to the D, you can call it D-ester.